This video is about Moore's circle. In the previous video, we talked about stress tensors and stress states. It is sometimes necessary to know what the stress state is in one coordinate system or a different coordinate system, and Moore's circle is a graphical method that allows us to move from one coordinate system to another. As an example, let's consider a system which has the coordinate system like this, x1 and x2. There is then some small volume unit in here, which we could define with that same coordinate system, x1 and x2. We might, however, be interested in what the loading is on a different coordinate system, like this. Sorry, this is difficult to draw. Let's just move out here. So on a different coordinate system, x1 prime and x2 prime, we might want to know what are the stresses acting on that little volume unit. So if in x1, x2, the loading looked like this, it turns out that on x1 prime, x2 prime, the loading looks like this. So the same external loading can cause different internal loading states. This one here is experiencing normal stresses. When we consider this coordinate system, there are shear stresses. Those are both actually acting at the same time. It's just asking on, on which planes or in which directions are these stresses acting. So we need to be able to identify essentially where different stress states are. So we want to be able to find, for example, where is the maximum shear stress. This will be important when we start considering plastic deformation and dislocation movement. We also want to be able to find where are the principal stresses. And the principal stresses is the stress state where there is no shear. principal stresses, and this is where there's no shear. So like I said, Moore's circle is a graphical representation which lets us do this. Let's take a look at how that would work. So in the Moore's circle, the coordinate system looks like this. On the x-axis, we plot the normal stress. On the y-axis, we plot the shear stress. So this symbol tau often is used to represent shear stress. Just sort of as a side note, in the stress tensor, we would have called the shear stress sigma 1, 2. That name for the shear stress still applies. Sometimes, though, we'll see it, see it written as tau 1, 2, and we should know that these are equivalent uh, notations for a shear stress. Okay, so this is the space in which a Mohr circle is drawn. Now, this is a very important note about the convention, and this is for a Mohr circle only. Okay, and this can be a little bit confusing. So let me try to explain this. When we talked about shear stresses, this was our coordinate system. So this is back to sort of real space, right? I have an x1, x2. This is in real space. If we had a shear stress like this, we can call this sigma 1, 2, or as I said before, tau 1, 2, right? This we would have called positive because it was acting on the one face but in the positive x2 direction. We'd have actually called both of these shear stresses that I've drawn here positive. But it's not possible to do that in the Moore circle space. So in Moore circle space, so in Moore's circle space, we use the following convention. If the shear stress would cause a clockwise rotation, so if tau leads to a clockwise rotation, 
Then we plot that positive on the tau axis. Instead, if tau would cause a counterclockwise rotation, then we plot it as negative on the tau axis. Right, so if we come back to this example over here and we consider this rotation, that's actually going to make a counterclockwise rotation of this body, right? left to its own devices, it would cause a counterclockwise rotation. So we're going to plot that down here. Right? This other one, though, up here, this would cause a clockwise rotation, and we're going to plot that one up here on the tau axis. So that's just sort of a convention note. It's important that we pay attention to that so that we can keep the signs of our stresses straight. Okay, so we know that we're going to plot this then on this sigma versus tau space. Let's take a look at how we actually do that. Okay, so let's assume that we have some stress tensor, stress state that looks like this. So sigma 1, 1, sigma 2, 2, sigma 1, 2, sigma 2, 1. And we're going to let all of our other stresses be zero. You can deal with a three-dimensional more circle. It's just more complicated. So we're going to always, when we're doing a more circle right now, we're just going to assume that we have stresses within one plane. The other thing we're going to assume here is that sigma 1, 2, uh, as, a, as a number in our stress tensor, is greater than 0. Okay, so how to do the plot? Okay, so we're going to do step one. We're going to plot sigma 1, 1, and then negative sigma 1, 2 as point A. All right, so let's see if I can fit all of this here. So this is our Mohr circle space. So we have tau, we have sigma. So we're plotting this point here as A. Then our next step, we're going to plot our other normal stress. Then we're going to plot this as point B. And so I'm just sort of making up where these are because I haven't given you numerical values yet for what the normal stresses are. So we're going to call that B. We're going to connect these. So connect A to B. And then we're going to essentially sweep out the circle that connects them, right? So we're going to take that diameter and basically swing it around and make a circle. And that makes our Mohr circle. Okay, this isn't a terribly round circle, but, but you get the point. Okay, so if we had numerical values for our stresses, then we could actually find those points A and B, we can find the center of this circle, and we can uh, draw up that circle then. Now that we've seen how to plot it, let's take a look at how we use the Mohr circle. Okay, so the first thing to note is how we use the Mohr circle to identify the rotations that we would need. So if we originally started with that x1, x2 coordinate system, and we're interested then in finding the rotation that would take us to a different coordinate system, let's say x1 prime, x2 prime, right? We want to know what is this value of theta here, this rotation. And one thing to note then is that positive rotations, like the one I'm showing above, go 
go counterclockwise from that AB line in our Mohr's circle. Right, so let's just draw this and take a look. So in our Mohr's circle space, this is sigma, this is tau. We had some line here, A, B, and so the positive rotation then is this direction. This is the positive rotation, but it turns out, let me pick a different color here. It turns out, so this is that same rotation, but because of the way that our space works, this angle is actually two theta, right? Because these are not, sigma and tau are not in fact 90 degrees apart from one another in real space. They're actually only 45 degrees apart from one another in real space. So in more circle space, let's just be clear about this, more circle space, we have a rotation of 2 theta, which is equal to a rotation of theta in real space. Okay, and the convention is that if we're moving counterclockwise in more circle space, right here, we're moving counterclockwise, and that corresponds to this positive rotation in real space. Okay, let's take a look then at how we can find the principal stress state and the maximum shear stress state graphically. Okay, so let's draw this out really quickly one more time. Again, if you have numerical values, you're going to know where this circle is. You aren't just going to be arbitrarily drawing it on here as I am. And we'll get to that in a minute. So we have our points on here. And after we've drawn our points on here, and they, it does not always look like this exact same angle. This is the case where it's just, this is our example that we're dealing with. Okay, so we have our center point here, and we can find the maximum shear stresses in the following way. So our maximum shear stresses actually are this point right here and this point right here. Okay, so these are the max shear stress. And so sort of numerically, right, there's still a normal stress acting at this point, and it's whatever this average stress value is. So those are our, our maximum shear stress points. And then we can find our principal stress state, so the state where there is no shear stress. And those are these points right here and right here, right? And so those we can find by knowing the average stress and essentially the radius of the circle. So these orange points are our principal stresses. And we can see graphically that there's no shear stress acting because those points are right there on that x-axis. One thing to note is that the maximum shear stress state is on this circle, it's 90 degrees away, and so in real space, it's a 45 degree rotation from the principal stress state. So graphically, that's how we find these things. And now we can take a look algebraically at how we could determine the principal stresses, the maximum shear stresses, and then the angle between those states as well. Okay, so in either case, we need to be able to find the center of that circle, right? And the center is, we call it sigma average, and we just sum up those principal stresses and divide by two. That gives us the value of the center. We need to be able to find the length of the radius, and we use the following equation to do so. We take our shear st stress squared, and then 
essentially that difference between the average stress and one of the principal stresses squared, this is going to give us our radius, right? Uh, so our maximum shear stress from the graphical approach that we did last time, the maximum shear stress is just equal to R. And then the principal stresses, or the normal stresses, sorry, at that same time, so in the maximum shear stress state, the normal stresses are equal to sigma average. In the principal stress state, we know that by definition, the shear is zero, and our principal stresses are sigma average plus or minus r. So this is, these are the equations that we can use, and in the video that follows, I work through a numerical example which shows how to actually use these. So for our last thing, let's just take a look at how we find the angle of rotation that is needed to bring us to the principal stress state. So if we work through the, the trigonometry, we find that it's the tangent of some two theta angle, and we're gonna call this two theta p. So this is uh, using sort of the geometry of more circle space. That's why we have the two theta p there. If we do the tangent, that's the shear stress sigma one two, divided by sigma 1, 1 minus sigma average. And so we can, you can sort of uh, mathematically work through to solve for theta p. Okay. And then, so this gives the angle to the principal stress state. And then we saw before that the maximum shear stress state is 45 degrees away. And so we can just find the angle to the maximum shear stress state as theta p minus pi over four, if you're dealing in radians, or theta p minus 45 degrees, if you're dealing in degrees. Okay, so that talks about how we use the Mohr circle construction. And let's just summarize what we've talked about. So our Mohr circle space uses a coordinate system of normal stress on the x-axis, shear stress on the y-axis. We sweep out a circle that represents our plane stress state, and we are able to, using this construction, find both our maximum shear stress state and our principal stress state, the angle between our original stress state and either of those as well. And again, the reason we want to do this is that we, we may want to know in our uh, component you know, what is the stress state acting on this volume unit that's rotated differently? Or where is it that a maximum stress state is occurring and how might the deformation be different there? So that's how to use Mohr's circle. And if you watch the next video, you'll see an example of how it actually works numerically.